morning. I'm Pastor Joe. We just finished a sermon series last Sunday called The Shepherd, and uh, we're looking forward to next Sunday when we launch an all-new sermon series called Taking the Land or Take the Land, and Pastor Emily and I are excited about that. So we want to make sure you're back here next week for the launch of that, but that leads us to today, and today is going to be a standalone sermon called The Cross Before Me. And we want to look at this. I want to look at it through the lens of Mark chapter 8. If you have your Bible, you can turn there and follow along. It's going to be on the screen as well. I'm going to walk through this. I'm not going to be reading it word for word, but I will summarize what's happening here. Okay. So Mark chapter 8, this is what's happening. Jesus is out. He's doing ministry with his disciples as they were doing that. They were traveling from town to town, village to village. And along the way, Jesus decides to have a little pop quiz. He wants to ask the disciples some questions. And the first question on the quiz was, who do people say that I am? And so some of the disciples begin to chime in. Some say, well, you're, they say that you're Elijah. Others say that you're John the Baptist. Still others say that you're one of the prophets. Jesus seems to be satisfied with that answer, so he proceeds to question number two. Now he wants to know, who do you say that I am? This time, not all the disciples chime in, just one, and it's Peter. Peter's the guy that's kind of the leader of the group. He's the bold one, the brave one. So he says, you are the Messiah. Now, in other Gospels, it gives more detail on the conversation that unfolds there. But basically, Jesus confirms that. Here in Mark, Jesus simply says, don't tell anybody who I am. And so now that he's established, okay, I'm the Messiah, you know that, I know that, he's going to now tell them what the, what the Messiah is supposed to do. What's he going to have to do? And he begins to tell them, this is what's going to happen. He tells them very plainly, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be killed. And then on the third day, I will rise. But Peter, he doesn't like this. So he takes Jesus aside and he begins to rebuke Jesus. He starts telling him, no, that's, that's not what's going to happen. But Jesus then turns and rebukes Peter in return. He says, Peter, no, I'm rebuking you. Get behind me, Satan. And he says, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. I think it's interesting here when he says, when it says, Jesus turned and looked at the disciples and he rebuked Peter. I wonder what that look was. Was it a look to say, can you believe this guy, Peter? Like, what's up with that? He just said I was the Messiah, and now he's rebuking me. Like, can you believe Peter? Or it could have been maybe a look that said, I'm rebuking Peter, but don't think that I don't know that's what you were thinking too. I, I don't know what that look was, and I'm curious what it was about. But either way, he rebukes Peter, and then he proceeds, and he calls to the crowd now and his disciples, and this is what he says. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. If you go to the next slide. He says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes into his Father's glory with the holy angels. Okay. So I want to ask a few questions for my sermon today. Jesus started with asking some questions. And so I want to ask some questions as well. The first question that I have is this. Why did Jesus tell them not to tell anyone who he was? Have you ever wondered that? I mean, it's not just here in this story. It's in other places in the Bible as well. Jesus will heal someone or something will happen and he warns them, but don't tell anybody. And for me, my whole life, I've been told, tell everyone who Jesus is. So when I read that, I'm like, well, that's kind of like a contradiction. Why would he not want everyone to know who he was? And the answer to this question could be a lot of things. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, potentially some of which maybe we will never know this side of eternity. But I think one of the big reasons why Jesus didn't want everyone to know who he was, that he was the Messiah, was because if they knew, it could potentially interfere with his mission, why it was that he came in the first place. 
So Jesus came for a lot of reasons. He came to teach us. He came to show us the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came to show us love. But ultimately, the reason that he came was to die. His mission was to die, to become the sacrifice for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the entire world. That's why he came. And so if everyone found out that he was the Messiah, that could have potentially prohibited or messed up the timeline of him dying. If you remember, Messiah means the anointed one. And all of Israel, the Jewish people, were expecting and anticipating this Messiah to come, but they had in mind something different than what Jesus actually came to do the first time. We know Jesus is coming again. We now have a complete picture. But the first time, he came to die. So what would have happened is in this society at this time, all of Israel was expecting a Messiah, someone from God to come, and actually to establish a government and to be a military leader. That's what he's going to do, just not right now. We see that, for example, in Isaiah chapter 11. It says, a root will come out of the stump of Jesse. Jesse is David's father, King David. Last week we talked a little bit about King David. King David was known as the best king in Israel, but not just the best king, he was also a warrior. He killed Goliath, he led military campaigns, he was a warrior king. And so people were anticipating this Messiah, Jesus, known as the son of David, to come in that image, to come and be what David was, a king and a warrior, and they wanted him to overthrow the, the enemies of Israel, overthrow the Roman government that had established itself there, kick them out, and establish Israel, once again, as its own thing. So that's what they were all wanting to have happen. So if everyone would have gotten this in their mind, it could have potentially caused a bunch of people to gather around Jesus and prohibited his death. When the, when the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the experts of the law took him in front of the Roman Empire and said, hey, we need to have him crucified, they could have stopped that by force. They could have had a rebellion. No, we're not going to let that happen. This is the Messiah. We're not going to let him die. Or... Another alternative could have been that the Roman Empire itself could have found out, hey, this is the Messiah, and we're going to take him out before he gains leadership ability to, and he gains too many followers. We can see that in an example in the Christmas story. Every year at Christmas time, we talk about the wise men. If you remember, when they came to find Jesus, they stopped to see King Herod first. And King Herod found out, well, this is the king of the Jews, this is the Messiah. He decides, I need to take out Jesus before he gains too many followers, before he matures in his leadership. And so he tries to trick the wise men. They could not be tricked because they were wise. And he decides, well, I'm just going to kill all the newborn babies under the age of two. That was his way of trying to prevent Jesus from gaining too much authority. So we could have seen something similar to that happen in the Roman Empire. So Jesus, it's a long story, but I wanted to get this right first because this will set up the other questions as we go. He didn't want everyone to find out who he was because it could have interfered with his mission, messed with the timing and the timeline of his mission, which was to die. Okay, so let's go to question number two. Why did Peter rebuke Jesus? And I think ultimately Peter rebuked Jesus because he didn't understand he did not understand. He was in the same mentality of everyone else in the society that Jesus came to establish a government and to overthrow the enemies of Israel. And how could it be that if Jesus came to do that, that he was going to die? He didn't understand. I think if he truly understood, he wouldn't have rebuked Jesus. He would have fallen to his knees and worshipped Jesus in awe of who he was and what he was about to do for them. But Peter didn't understand. He didn't get it. And we see that throughout Peter's story. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, literally when Jesus was about to be taken away to be killed, what happened? Peter was there. Peter drew a sword. Now, luckily, Peter was not a soldier. He was a fisherman, so he wasn't very good with the, with the sword. He swings, but he misses a fatal blow. Instead, he just cuts off an ear. <laughs> Jesus heals the ear. But that was his mindset. No, Jesus, I'm not going to let this happen on my watch. I'm not going to let that happen. You cannot die. He didn't understand. And I don't think it was just Peter either. I think the other disciples had that same thought process. Even after he, he was resurrected in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, it says that the disciples gathered around him and they asked, Jesus, is at this time that you're going to restore Israel? 
They didn't understand either. So Peter didn't understand. Things were not as they seemed. And then that leads me to my next question. Do we ever rebuke Jesus? And I think our initial response is, no, I would never rebuke Jesus. That doesn't, I would, I would never do that. But in the same way that Peter did not understand, I don't think we understand always either. And we might not say, Jesus, I rebuke you, but by our words and our actions, sometimes I think we do. We, in one breath, like Peter, say, Jesus, you're the Messiah. And then in the next breath, we say, but you don't know what you're doing. We say, you're the Savior, and I'm going to follow you anywhere. And then we say, but I'm going to go this way. And so we begin to rebuke him with our words and our actions because we don't have a proper understanding either. So we have to then get a proper understanding. That would be the next question. How do we gain a proper understanding? And so I think this goes back to some of the things that Jesus mentioned to Peter when he rebuked him. He said, you don't have the things of God in mind. You have the things of men in mind. So what are those things of men? Now, when I say men, I don't just mean males. I mean mankind. So what are the things that mankind cares about? In the minds of men, there's things like this, power, position, the opinions of other men or other people, wealth, possessions, authority, fame, or even simply ourself. We think about ourself. So those are the things that Jesus is trying to deal with, with Peter and with all of us. And so what we need is a mindset shift a mindset shift. We've got to get our minds right. We need to change the way that we view things, change the way that we see things, change the way that we understand things. We need to have a biblical worldview, or what Jesus would say would be a kingdom worldview. Jesus was always talking about his kingdom. He would say, the kingdom of God is like this, or the kingdom of heaven is like this. He said, in my kingdom, it will be this way. Even when he taught us to pray, he said, pray this, thy kingdom come. So all throughout his ministry, he was trying to get his followers, including you and me now, to see things the way that he sees them, to stop viewing things the way that men sees, views things, stop looking at them the way the world looks at them. Put that stuff behind you. Put the world behind you. You're done with that. You're done with the opinions of men. You're done with caring about position and power. You're done with all of those things. You're done with sin. You're following me. Stop thinking like that. Change the way that you think. And so that would be the next thing. How do we do that? How do we change the way that we think? How do we gain a proper understanding of these things? And I think when we do that, we, we have to go back to what the scripture says, is that, says this, that we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. But how do we have the mind of Christ? It's through the Spirit. The Spirit will teach us all things of God, including the deep things of God. So when we need to understand things and see things the way that God sees them, we need the Holy Spirit to help us with that. The Bible says that God is a good father and he loves to good, give good, good gifts. He loves to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And so if we need more of his spirit, we need to ask for more of his spirit. Not just his spirit, but his heart. Lord, I need your heart. Will you give me your heart? Will you help me to love the things that you love? Will you help me to hate the things that you hate? I want to think like you. I want to act like you. I want to leave all of this other stuff behind me. So we have to have a mindset shift. I think the more of the Holy Spirit that we get in us, the more of the mind of Christ that we have, but also the more of us that gets into the Word of God, the Bible, we have to view things through the Scriptures. And so sometimes that's a challenge, but I think we've got to soak some, spend time every day reading His Word. It doesn't have to be hours at a time, but even just a few minutes reading his words, reading his teachings, reading what he's saying, trying to get things like this. Where is my mind? Is it on me? Or is it on him? And allowing every decision, every thought to be processed and to be viewed through the lens of Scripture. We have to have a mindset shift. When I was growing up, I used to hear this phrase, um, so-and-so is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. You ever heard that? I think we know kind of what that means. And I've even said it before. But when I think about that, like, that's wrong. I would rephrase it. I would say, you know, you shouldn't be wrong-minded about heavenly things. We need to have a, the right view of heavenly things, but we absolutely need to be heavenly-minded. 
we absolutely have to be thinking about things the way that God thinks about things all the time. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. The next question is, how did he get to taking up the cross? So he went from rebuking Peter to now you have to take up your cross. It, it seems like a, a bit of a shift there. So what's happening? And I think, can you go to the next slide real quick? Okay, go back to the other one. All right. So taking up the cross, there's a shift here. And Jesus is now telling them, you've got to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. But didn't the disciples already do that? I mean, they had already left their jobs, their families, their homes. Some of them were fishermen. They left their boats on the seashore, but they were following Jesus. So it seems like they already denied themselves. They were already taking up their cross. They were already following him. And sometimes I think we think that too. Like, I am following you, Jesus. I already gave up this stuff, and I'm, I'm following you. But he must be talking then about something more. There must be more to this because they were already following him. And I think it goes back to what we just mentioned, the things of men. I think the disciples, even then, had things in mind that were of men and not of God. They were following Jesus, but perhaps not always for the right reasons. They were after Jesus, following after Jesus, but they had in mind positions maybe like leadership and authority and power. Why would that have been? Well, Jesus was about to establish a government, or so they thought, and they were his right-hand men, so they would then have position. They would be famous. They would be part of this on the ground floor, and they would get all this authority, so maybe they were following Jesus because that's what they had in mind, all these things. Sometimes we follow him because of the benefits that we think we're going to get. Now, don't get me wrong, there are benefits to following Jesus, right? First, of course, salvation in eternity with him. We are, there are blessings, there's favor attached, there's love, there's peace, there's all of those things that we get when we follow him. But sometimes we just want the benefits instead of wanting him. And so that's where I think Jesus is trying to get them to go. Like, guys, you're still thinking about things of men. I think they were thinking about power and position, just one chapter ahead, Mark chapter 9, again, the disciples were traveling with Jesus. In between the villages, they were having a conversation. When they got to where they were going, Jesus said, what were you all talking about back there? He knew, and they knew, they didn't want to tell him because they were talking about who was the greatest among them. They were concerned with position. Another example, Mark chapter 20, verse 20 and forward from there, we see a story when two of the disciples' mother came to Jesus. The mother said, Jesus, do me a favor. These two sons of mine that are following you, when you come into your kingdom, let one sit at your left and one sit at your right. And Jesus said, well, that's not for me to decide. But what happened here is an argument ensued. There was bitterness and bickering among the disciples. How could you let your mother ask that to question? Like, what's going on? Like, and they start going back and forth. They start going at it, arguing about this. Finally, Jesus says, no, that's enough. Stop. Stop arguing about that. Don't you know that that's what the Gentiles do? In other words, that's what people who don't know me do. That's what the world cares about. They care about position, power, title, authority, but not in my kingdom. He said, even the Pharisees lorded over the other people. Not in my kingdom. It's not going to be like that in my kingdom. In my kingdom, it's going to be like this. Whoever wants to be the greatest will be the servant or the slave to everyone. In my kingdom, whoever wants to be first will be last. In my kingdom, it's going to be like what I do. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what it's like in my kingdom. So he's trying to expand their thoughts. Stop thinking the way that men think. Put the worldly things behind you and follow me. And I think that's part of what he was talking about when he said, take up the cross. It's not about you anymore. It's about me. Die to those things. Okay, next slide. So what does it look like to lose your life? There's a passage here Jesus just said. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake or for the sake of the gospel will save it. So what does it look like for us to lose our lives? I think one way to look at this is through the Christmas movie. I mentioned Christmas twice now. Is anybody ready for Christmas? 
somebody's got their decorations ready for November 1st. They're going to pull them out, throw them up. Like, yes, it's ready. We're, we're already ready for Hallmark and everybody else. Anyway. I will say, driving home last night, I did see some Christmas trees decorated in someone's yard. It's happening. It's coming. But Christmas, right? The, the Christmas Carol with Scrooge. You guys seen that movie with Scrooge, right? He was, he was wealthy. He cared about the things of, of this world. He cared about money, possessions, all that stuff. But what we see is what he thought was life was actually killing him. He had no life at all. He was miserable. He was lonely. But throughout the movie, he has a heart change at the end. He was losing his life, his possessions and wealth, giving that stuff away. But then he discovered, this is truly life when I have relationships, when I have blessed other people, that, that changes my life. And I actually have a life now. So that could be one way to view this, one lens to look at this through. As we think in terms of the world, if we're trying to grab onto what the world says is important, we're actually dying. But if we pursue God and to let that stuff fall off, we actually find life. The other way to look at it is through literal dying. That was what would happen to most of the disciples. They would die for their faith. They would die for the gospel. Not just those disciples, but throughout church history, throughout world history, even now, today, in this world, people are still dying for their faith. They are standing and they're proclaiming, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I will not deny that. And they are losing their life. They're losing a physical life, but they're gaining an eternal life a life that is truly life. So what does that mean for us? Like, we live in America. We're not really probably going to face that. We have rights and we have protections. So unless something crazy happens, that's, that's not going to be our future. We're not going to face death. So I think that puts us back into the first example, where we are consumed with this American mindset of consumerism. People around the world are dying for their faith. What are we dying to? Are we dying to our own desires, our own need or wants that we don't really need or even want? It's, it's just what we do. That's one of the reasons why we support missionaries, right? We give of ourselves sacrificially so we can send money to people who are willing to die for the gospel. That's what we do. So one of the things that we might not face is death because of the gospel. But what we will almost certainly face is the next question is the ashamed part. Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me in front of this sinful and uh, sinful generation, I will be ashamed of them before my Father in heaven. But why would they have been ashamed? I mean, they were following Jesus, denying themselves, carrying the cross. Why would they have been ashamed? I think it might go back to, again, those things of men those things of men, Con concerned about what other people think, concerned about their position and, and authority. When, when people find out that Jesus wasn't that conquering king Messiah, what would they think of me for following him? What are they going to say? Oh, you followed the guy that died? <laughs> and then he told you you're supposed to die too? Like, I don't know. That seems silly. And so maybe that would have been part of it. They had in mind these great things, but in reality, that wasn't what was going to happen. Would that have caused them to feel ashamed? My next question is, have you ever been ashamed? And that's kind of a strange way, to, for me at least, to think about it, ashamed. Like, have I been ashamed? So I put the definition, or actually Greg put the definition on the screen, ashamed. It's embarrassed or guilty because of one's actions, characteristics, or associations. So that puts it a little bit easier to grasp. Have you ever been ashamed? I don't know. Have you ever been embarrassed because of your associations with Jesus? That's a tough question to ask yourself. When I was a kid, for a few years, I went to a private Christian school. It's called Toledo Christian School. And I remember one day being out at the store with my mother, and my, my two siblings were there. But we were checking out at the cashier. Uh, she asked me, she was asking all of us, but she asked me specifically, what school do you go to? And it was Toledo Christian School, but I didn't want to tell her that because I felt embarrassed. And we usually call Toledo Christian School TCS for short. And I knew my mother wouldn't think twice about me saying TCS because we always called it TCS. And I knew this lady probably wouldn't know what TCS was, so I just said TCS. 
because I didn't want to feel embarrassed. I didn't want to feel different. I didn't want her to look at me as though I was different than anyone else. But why? Why would I have felt that way? I don't know. I don't know. We, we shouldn't feel embarrassed. We, we should be ashamed of sin, not ashamed of our Savior. And so why would I have felt that? I, I honestly don't know, but here's the point. Jesus is even giving us a comparison. He says, if you're ashamed of me in front of this sinful generation, in front of these people who don't know the truth, who don't get it, who are lost, if you're ashamed in front of them, come on, guys. Get with it. We know the truth. We should not be ashamed of the truth. And we cannot be ashamed of the gospel either. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation unto all who believe. And we can't be ashamed either. We have to be unashamed. We have to be unashamed because this world needs Jesus. They need us to look different. They need us to stand out. There's darkness in this world. One glance at the headlines will tell you that this world is searching. They're in need of a Savior. They're in need of Jesus. They're in need of him. And we have what they need. But if we're ashamed or embarrassed to let our light shine in this darkness, they're never going to find him. We cannot be ashamed of the gospel. We have to stand. And I think that's part of what it means to carry a cross. Carry a cross. Even before Jesus died. The cross was a symbol of shame, rejection, ridicule. Jesus carried the cross. He literally carried the cross among those conditions. People were ridiculing him. They were, they were insulting him. But he carried the cross nonetheless, and he carried it with love and for love. And we may be walking through this world, and we may receive some of that criticism, and we will carry it with love and for love, because people need to know that there is a Savior in this world who loves them and who has a plan for them, and he wants them to be with them in eternity forever. We cannot be ashamed. We have to let our light shine. Okay. The next slide. So my final questions... And I'm going to invite Pastor Leah to, to come and begin to, to play a little bit. So the question Jesus asked his disciples was, who do you say that I am? That's the same question that I ask you today. Who do you say that he is? And based on your answer to that question, how does it drive your actions? Do you rebuke Jesus through your actions? We say in one breath the same thing that Peter said, Jesus, you're the Messiah. And then, then in the next breath, we say, but you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you don't know how it's supposed to go. No, Jesus, you've got something wrong. You know, I, I was supposed to be the one to get promoted. Jesus, didn't you know that? I was, I was supposed to be the one that got married. I was supposed to be the one that had the baby. I was supposed to be the one that got rich, got famous. We don't have a proper understanding always because we need more of his spirit. We need more of him in us to change the way that we think and perceive things. And even when things don't turn out the way that we think, we have to know that Jesus had a plan. It didn't turn out the way that Peter thought it would either. Peter wasn't expecting Jesus to die. He was trying to prevent him from dying. But Jesus came first to conquer sin, the ultimate enemy of Israel and all of us. And he's coming again to overthrow the physical enemies and take care of all the other problems. It didn't work out the way Peter thought, but he had a better plan, a bigger plan, a bigger vision. And that's the way that we need to learn to think and look. We need to look past this life. This life is so short. James says that this life is like a mist or a vapor. You can't even grab it. It's here and it's gone. You can't grasp it. Stop thinking about just what's right in front of you. Think bigger picture, longer term. Get my spirit in me or in you and you in the word. Let it change the way that you think. So what are some of the things of the world that you need to put, you, put behind you? Are there things in your life that you need to put behind you that that's what the world cares about? I'm putting the world behind me and the cross before me. And then who needs you to be unashamed? You know who needed me to be unashamed? That lady at the checkout. Just a little boy telling her, yeah, I go to Christian school. 
maybe would have changed the way that she viewed people. Maybe it would have changed the way her understanding was. I don't, you don't never know what someone's going through. You never know where they're at in life. Just a little glimmer of hope, a little spark of light could change someone's day, someone's week, someone's life. Someone needs you to be unashamed tomorrow at work, tomorrow at school. Your neighbors, people around you, your family, don't shy away from shining your light in this city. You cannot be ashamed. The last question I have is, if you're here today, would you like to follow Jesus? If you've never made that decision, if you've never said, yeah, you know what? I wanna be a part of what he's doing. I like the way that he casts vision for this kingdom that's coming. I wanna be in that kingdom. If that's you, I wanna invite you in just a moment to come. I would like to pray with you. If you've never made a decision to follow him, today's your day. So what I want to do now is Pastor Lee is going to play through this song, and I just want you to sit and listen to the words the first time through. And I want you to think about these questions and allow the Spirit of God to speak to you and to reveal maybe what you need to do different. If you want to receive Jesus and follow Him, I want you to come to the front. After she sings through this first time, what I'd like to do, if you're comfortable and able, to stand. And I would like us to sing as a congregation as we close the service today by just singing the words of this song together. Pastor Lee, if you would play. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Father, we thank you for this morning and the opportunity to gather in this house. Lord, I ask that you would go with each of us this week and that you would reveal to us through the power of your Holy Spirit and the truth found in your word, the way that you want us to think, the way that you want us to act. Lord, that you would empower us and embolden us to be witnesses in this world. 
God, that we would put the things of men out of our minds, that we would throw those things off, that we would recenter ourselves, putting you first, following you always, no matter what. May we not be afraid or embarrassed, but may we be bold, shining our lights for you. Bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.